Thank you, Marius, Marius, for such a nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks everyone for attending. Um, I know that the topic of linguistical issues of legal terminology is not usually the most interesting one, so I will try to make it more interesting than it, that, than it usually is. Um, first, I will provide some introduction about specifics of legal vocabulary and legal syntax uh, with a focus on European legal acts. Uh, and then we will go to the fun stuff and we will try to see how well you know English legal terminology in uh, cross-border enforcement uh, by testing a Kahoot game that I created for you. Uh, if you have never tried Kahoot before, don't worry, you will get all the information and all the instructions. It's very easy. You don't need to have anything downloaded. Uh, you just need your phone or separate screen on your computer. Uh, you will get all the instructions once we get there. So some basic stuff about legal vocabulary at first. Uh, now with legal acts, there are different um, types of legal vocabulary. So legal vocabulary can be divided in specific groups, uh, which we encounter in most legal acts. Um, so the first group is technical terminology, technical meaning that it is specific to a legal context. So we have some words that are only used in legal language. Um, I have some examples on this slide. So litigation is specifically a legal term, authentic instrument, court of origin, free movement of persons, recognition, enforcement. This is all legal terms. So this is one group of words. Um, this group also includes some words from other languages, uh, which can be in their original form or in their adapted form. Uh, the um, um, spelling could be adapted or the linguistical aspects could be adapted, the grammar could be adapted. Uh, and in legal vocabulary, this is mostly from Latin or from French. Um, so also the topics that we are dealing with, cross-border enforcement, we are encountering uh, some terms like exequatur, lex fori, lis pendens. This is all technical terminology, but adopted from Latin. Um, then there is semi-technical terminology. Semi-technical terminology are the terms that are used in English, uh, that are used in general English or in legal context, but they have different meanings when we are dealing with them in different contexts. So, for example, actor means a party in European Union uh, documents. Um, of course, in everyday, in everyday world, actor also means person who is acting on TV or in the theater or something like that. Service can be, in general English, can mean like service in a restaurant, for example. In law, of course, it means, uh, it means the official act of delivering uh, some mail or some document which has legal consequences. Uh, and the last group are general terms which are also used in legal context but mean the same as in regular language. Um, the examples of these are theft, witness, judge, agreement. So these are the words that are used in everyday language, but they're also used in English um, legal documents. Now, what is a bit more interesting? So this was just a, some general notes on the vocabulary. Now, what is more interesting are some special features that we also encounter in the documents that we are dealing with in cross-border enforcement. Um, so I have some special features listed here, and we will go through those. As I said at the beginning, will be more theoretical, then we go to the fun part. Um, so the first special feature of legal acts is that we are using a lot of formal expressions, which I'm sure is the first thing that you notice when you have to deal with, uh, with English terminology uh, and some archives, archism, which are not used in everyday language anymore. So the examples that I have here uh, are, for example, whilst we, are, we would use while in normal English, uh, subject to the provisions of where necessary and insofar as possible or nothing in this title shall, pre shall preclude. So very formal language. This is the first special feature that we encounter when dealing with, with, with English texts. Um, then we are usually also dealing with complex prepositions, uh, which are also listed here. Here, like instead of under the article, we like to use pursuant to article or, or the contract or in the event of instead of if. Uh, in accordance with instead of according to. So we like to complicate matters in terms of propositions as well. Um, one specific um, characteristic of legal English are also uh, binomial or multinomial expressions. This means that, there are you, that um, several words are used which have very similar meaning uh, or the same meaning, uh, but they're used to emphasize certain aspects. Uh, like I have here under or, uh, um, uh, so sorry, under or in accordance with, 
give the voice and bequeath. This last one is usually used in um, uh, the will in the last testaments. But um, we are more often encountering like terms and conditions. This is already one binomial expression. So terms and conditions basically both mean conditions of something, uh, but they're repeated in English legal texts. So to continue, then we are using some specific compounds, prepositions and adverbs, which are again, complicated. Um, very often we are using here and after, which means from this point onward, like from this point in the text forward, um, thereafter, again, from that point on, here, here and after, thereafter are, are very similar. Uh, they mean they can mean the same thing if they're referring to the text or thereafter could mean from that date on if it's uh, more temporal, if it has more temporal context. Um, then we have therefore, which means for that reason, thereof, which means from the time of the cited item. So I have some examples here on the slide that you can see. Um, like therefore can be used for this regulation should therefore provide meaning meaning so in, in more simple English or thereof um, an appeal against the declaration is to be lodged within one month of service thereof where this thereof refers to the declaration of course. Um, European Union documents, uh, European Union instruments are also using some words um, that are pertaining to higher register, this basically means that are fancier than what, than what, we, will use, what we would use in everyday language. Um, examples are alien, we use alien instead of foreign, commence instead of start, convene instead of gather, deem instead of consider. So uh, even if we would use foreign start, gather, consider, this would, this would be considered as uh, regular English words, which would be also used in legal context, but um, there is a preference to these higher register words. Um, in most uh, European Union institutions where they have the translation departments, they're trying to um, uh, move the whole um, tendency to use higher register uh, to the use of clearer English language, uh, to the use of clearer words, but this is still in the beginning. So um, lawyers like to use these complicated words. So there is a tendency to start using simple words, but we are not there yet. So you will still encounter many of those in legal texts. Um, then there is nominalization, which means that we are using um, nouns where we could be using words. And as a consequence, the sentence again becomes more complicated. Um, so here are some words listed. It could be the um, uh, court remedy the judgment, but we would we would rather use uh, a remedy can be filed to remedy the judgment. So we would use noun instead of a verb, or we are changing to access to the accession, which again sounds fancier Pro to proceed procedure. So we uh, in law uh, nouns are used more often than words where that is possible. Um, so these are some notes about the vocabulary. We are also encountering some specific um, characteristics of legal uh, English, of legal English um, as far as the syntax is concerned. So grammar syntax, uh, the way the sentences are formed or the way the text is formed. Um, the traditional, um, the typical thing that, that we all notice when we are dealing with uh, English legal terminology is of course the long and compl complex sentences uh, that are Generally, people are trying to avoid when they're writing regular English. So in regular English, um, it's so uh, we are used uh, in Slovenia and some other countries. I know that Germany is one example of such that we are used to longer sentences. We, we put a lot of smaller sentences together in one longer sentence. Uh, but in English, the, um, uh, inst the, the, the basic instruction, the tendency is to use shorter sentences to make the text clearer. Uh, this is the ideal to use short, shorter sentences. But in law, English is also the example of the language where long sentences are being used. Um, these sentences contain a lot of um, subordinate, subordinate sentences, a lot of embedded sentences. Uh, and we have two examples here, like it will be your duty when the case is submitted to you to determine from the evidence admitted for your consideration, applying there to the rules of law contained in the instructions given by the court, whether or not the defendant is guilty of defense as charged. So this could be split in several sentences and it would be more clear, but in law, we just like to complicate things. Uh, or even the second example, which is basically taken from uh, one of the directives, 
um, which has more than 80 words in one sentence. And uh, I'm sure that you noticed if you look at the titles of the regulations of directives, even the titles include these uh, embedded sentences, subordinated sentences. So they're very, very complicated. Um, I, I can speak for Slovenian um, language. So at least Slovenian legal acts have simpler titles than the ones in English. Uh, in the EU, in the EU in, um, that we can see here, for example. So Directive 2004 through 17 of the European Parliament and of the Council of 31st March 2004, coordinating the procurement procedures of entities operating in the water, energy, transport and postal services sectors. And sometimes we also have added uh, revoking some other directive. So it's very complicated, even in the title. Um, another Typical characteristic of uh, legal texts, which separates it from regular English, is frequent use of the passive. In general English, we are trying to avoid passive language. Um, active language is preferable. But in legal texts where the focus is on what is done rather than who has to do it or who does it, usually um, passive is completely acceptable. So, for example, rules on material and formal validity should be defined so that the informed choice of the spouses is, facilitate, is facilitated and that their consent, uh, then their consent is respected. It would be much simpler if we would say um, the, um, the, that we should respect the consent, consent, um, consent, sorry, it would be much more typical to general English, but we prefer passives in legal English. Uh, or, for example, where ap applicable, a court should be deemed to be seized in accordance with regulation instead of just saying uh, we should seize the court or the parties should seize the court. It's preferred to use the passive. So this is another typical aspect. Um, in EU legal texts, um, many times uh, regular pronouns are not used that often, which would mean it or this. But um, the words that are more often used are, for example, the aforesaid instead of this, when we are repeating the object, uh, like if we would say a party has to file um, uh, has to file an appeal before that date. Instead of saying this appeal or it should be filed by, uh, by the, uh, with the court, we would say the aforesaid appeal should be filed with the court. So again, complicated. Um, so this, this is one option, what is used instead of the, pronoun, the pronouns, and the other option is legal is lexical repetition, which means that we are using the same word over and over again instead of replacing it with it, which is what we would normally do in general English. Like with this example, uh, we are using the same object, the same subject, instead of using it instead of the name. Um, legal English, again, uses um, special connecting words to link sentences which are more complicated than the regular ones. Um, whereas provided that for the purpose of, in accordance with, pursuant to, within the meaning of, all of those are a bit more complicated again than in regular English. Um, another interesting uh, aspect, uh, another interesting uh, way that legal English um, is, uh, that sentences are formed in legal English is that um, it is preferred if we omit relative pronouns and the verbs to be, uh, where we are referring to the object or subject which is doing something. Like in this example, all the rights and remedies which are available to the party, uh, legal text can um, uh, omit this which are part. So it would only say all the rights and remedies available to the party can be uh, and so on. So uh, English, legal term, uh, English legal text like to omit some certain words. Um, then there is a tendency to avoid the negative particle not. Um, legal texts don't like to use um, term do not do that or the if the party does not do that, if the party, um, yeah, so if the party does not do something, uh, they rather use fail to. So instead of using the negative version, they change it to positive version. So the party failed to provide something instead of the party didn't provide something. Um, or other words that can be used to replace the not, to, to make the positive uh, sentence instead of a negative one could be never, unless, except, or just use negative prefixes such as on. Uh, so instead of just using negative sentences with not, don't, do, uh, did not, uh, other words are used to make it into a positive form. 
Um, then, just a few more. Uh, so there is um, a use of prepositions which are separate from their complements. Uh, in general English, it is preferred if we are using uh, prepositions together with the words they are referring to. But here, for example, we have tra tracing and identification of proceeds from or other property related to crime. So instead of what it would be in regular English, tracing and identification of proceeds from crime or other property related to crime, we just split it. So we separate the prepositions from the actual word. Uh, or the second example, illicit manufacturing of and trafficking in firearms. In nice English, it would be preferred if this would not be split. Um, the use of the, sub the subjunctive, this is an interesting one. I didn't notice this before, before I started researching this topic. So after a certain expressions that contain an order, a request, a wish, or hypothetical, um, a special type of uh, verb tends to be used in legal, uh, in legal texts. Uh, I will first use the examples to explain it. So even though someone may be eligible for an informal hearing, we will recommend that he attend a formal hearing. So there is no S included. It should be attends in normal English. But this is the form where S can be omitted. So it's not the third person, but the neutral type of the, uh, the neutral form of the verb is used. Or for example, there is also the recommendation that the council meet every week, not meets. So this is a special type of a verb used in English used after these certain expressions. Or there is the necessity that funding be found urgently instead of is found urgently. So this is another type of um, special characteristic that can be used in legal English, but are not generally used in regular one. Mm. Documents that are uh, issued by the EU institutions uh, also made a habit of uh, combining collective nouns with singular, singular or, or plural ver verbs depending on what they want to highlight, on what the emphasis should be. So if they want to emphasize the organization who did something, who um, issued some act or who issued some decision or made a decision or something like that, uh, the singular form of the verb is being used. Like the council has approved the content of the revised text. Uh, the focus is on the, the council. They want to emphasize that the council was the organ who did it, the organization, the institution. But plural, plural type of the verb is being used if the purpose is to highlight members within the organization. So in the second example, which says the commission have presented a report on the application of this regulation, it's used the commission have meaning that they're emphasizing members of the commission. So this is another interesting aspect of the way English is being used in this text. Um, and the last two ones that I have um, on this slide, uh, of course, we are mostly familiar with how shall can be used to uh, denote obligation or command instead of must or have to. So this is probably not a new information. Um, in the case of positive commands, we are using shall. So if the law applied to legal separation does not provide for the conversion of legal separation or into divorce, article, article 8 shall apply. Or if there is a negative command, this regulation shall not affect the application of the convention. Um, and another thing that became a tradition, kind of traditional, typical for EU texts, are some formulaic con conventions, so some specific words that are being used in legal texts, uh, which, are which are typical for uh, EU legal texts, not necessarily for, for all others. Um, they're listed here. So whereas is used to introduce the preamble section. So be before the pre preamble, uh, you have whereas, so it's kind of an introduction to that. Um, having regard to or acting in consideration of is used to um, indicate what the legal grounds are, so which acts were used as legal grounds for the act. Um, and then there are some typical phrases that are always used in the, in the end of the sentence, uh, in the, sorry, in the end of the act, like it shall apply from, or this regulation shall be binding in its, its, in its entirety and directly applicable in member states in accordance with the treaties. This is the sentence that is used in most regulations, so it is basically copy pasted. So these are some specific um, characteristics of uh, EU legal texts. Um, now, as far as the um, legal, inf the cross-border legal, inf the cross-border enforcement uh, of civil claims is concerned, 
we will check what you already know with a Kahoot. So this will be way more interesting than what we were doing now. Okay, I will assume that everyone who wanted to join already did. And I think that you can do it later again if you want to. So the first question that we will have is a test one, so you can see what's expected of you. So, um, okay, the question will show on the screen. So the first question is, how are you doing today? You can choose any answer. This doesn't count to your grade. So on your phone, you should have different colors, uh, squares of different colors. You can see the answers here. Like the question is here, how are you doing today? The answers are never better. If you've never been better, press the red button uh, on your touch screen. If, you've, if you're great, do the blue one. If you're meh, choose the yellow one. And if you're confused about the whole thing, just choose the green one. The time that is uh, that you have available is here. So for this one, you have 60 seconds. For other uh, questions, you will have a bit less. And here is how many of you already answered. So once the time runs out, you don't get any points. Uh, for this one, um, as I said, there are not, no points. But for the next ones that we are doing with the terminology, you are competing against each other. So that's great. Six of you are great. Two have never been better. One is meh. I'm sorry for that. I hope that you will have a nice weekend, weekend at least. So um, what you will be doing now for the next 20 questions that I have is you will comp compete against each other who answers um, the correct, uh, who finds the correct answer to the question. Um, the questions will be here. And uh, it's very important for you to choose the correct one. Otherwise, you don't get any points. But also, if several people answer correctly, uh, you get points depending on who answered first. So the first person who answers gets the most points. So it's also important that you answer fast. But it's more important that you answer correctly. So if you're not sure, just think about it. OK, so after every question, there will be a list. For now, no one has any points because this was a test question. Uh, if someone wants to join later, if you didn't manage before, you still have a pin here, you can join later, you will just not get any points for the first types of questions. So the other questions refer to the terminology. OK, so here we go instrument of general scope that is binding and directly applicable in all EU countries is called directive, judgment, regulation, or recommendation. Choose the correct answer. You have 30 seconds for each question. If you answer before that, it, the answer will show earlier. So which instrument of general scope is binding and directly applicable in all EU countries? Regulation. OK, great. So five of you answered correctly. Three of you chose the directive. Directive is not directly applicable. The uh, country, the, the member state has to adopt the legislation to meet the goals of the, of the directive, but a good try. So. Uh, here we have the, um, the chart after the first game. Spur is the first one on the list. Then we have Julio, Sara, Sarah, Bianca, and Marcos. Congratulations for the first five. The others, don't worry, you still have the time to catch up. The next question. The European order for payment procedure was established for the collection of what type of claims? Money claims, financial claims, valuable claims, pecuniary claims. Which one is the correct form of the word? Be careful about the expressions that are used in English texts. So you have to be precise. They can mean the same thing, but specific words are generally used in these um, instruments. Pecuniary, most of you had the correct answer. Congratulations. Let's see who is first now. Ooh. Oh, wow, great. Spud is doing amazing. Julio, Yaka, Marcus, and Sarah. Congratulations. Uh, and some of you are doing really great. Next question. A claim which has not been opposed by the other party is called uncontested claim, default judgment, affidavit, undisputed claim.
Uncontested claim, great. Most of you, again, have a very good knowledge of the terminology that, that is being used in this regulation, the regulations that we are dealing with. Uh, there has been some changes, but basically the same people just changing places for now. The rest of you, come on, catch up. Next question. The member state in which a decision, an instrument, or an order is issued is called member state of enforcement, member state of origin, member state of recognition, or member state of appeal. So member state in which a document is issued. Great, member state of origin is the correct answer. Oh, we have the same uh, order in the first places. Um, the notice ordering someone to appear in court is called. So how is the notice ordering someone to appear in court called? Summons, request to appear, invitation or service. Okay, let's see. The correct answer is summons. So let's see if something changes. Ooh, someone new came to the first five spots. Congratulations. Welcome to the top five. A claim brought by a defendant against the claimant in the same proceedings is called Appeal, service, objection, or counterclaim. So the answer is counterclaim. Almost everyone guessed correctly. This one doesn't seem to be too hard. Wow, Spur has the highest answer streak of seven. Every question answered correctly. And I think the rest of the first five too. Very, very, that, that's great. So documents shall be what? By postal service attested by an acknowledgement of receipt. Documents shall be sent by postal service forwarded, served or mailed. So some questions that I have are easier, some are a bit more difficult, especially when we have missing words. Let's see how you did with this one. The answer is served, of course. Served is the legal institute which has legal consequences as opposed to the others, which of course have the same, uh, mean the same actual act, but don't have the same consequences. Okay. Law of the court in which the action is brought is called lex loci delicti, lex spore, lis pendens, or force major. So law of the court in which the action is brought. Great, almost everyone had the correct answer again. It seems that my questions are way too easy. Congratulations. A judgment that is especially important, notable, and often cited is called landmark judgment, appeal to judgment, default judgment, or monumental judgment. Landmark judgment was the correct answer, of course. Let's see if there is any change. No, the same persons. You're doing great. A court order ordering a party do, to do something or preventing them from doing something is called 
affidavit, appeal, disclosure, or injunction. Injunction was the correct answer. No change again. Great, the five of you are amazing. The judge plays an active role in managing civil cases by helping the parties to something the case, to agree the case, to appeal the case, to settle the case, or to give up the case. Of course, settle the case is the correct answer. Almost no change. Marcus and Sarah changed places. An order to prevent a party from disposing of money of assets until a final decision is issued, uh, sorry, is issued is called empty order, cold order, freezing order, or urgent order. So an order to prevent a party from disposing of money before the final decision. Yes, freezing order is the correct answer. Everyone guessed this one. Great. Choosing the court which is most likely to issue a favorable judgment is called court browsing, forum shopping, the right to choose, or the main hearing. Yes, forum shopping, of course. Sarah is back. Declaration of enforceability is also called Indemnity, exequatur, recognition, or exemption. This one should be easy. Yes, of course, and everyone guessed correctly. The answer is exequatur. Ooh, even the Kahoot is saying Sarah is making a comeback with three in a row. The defendant was something to pay 1,000 euro in damages for each article published, commanded, ordered, forced, or charged. This one is a bit more, no, oh, okay, it's not that difficult, I guess. Ordered, yeah, the defendant was ordered. Okay, next question. After hearing the case, the court issues a something judgment, reasoned, grounded, justified, or motivated judgment. So the correct answer was reasoned. Uh, grounded, so there, there are grounds for a uh, decision, but it's not a grounded judgment. It's reasoned judgment when it's uh, when when the reasons are explained in the judgment why someone chose the, yeah, one, I have one a bit more difficult one. So it's a reasoned judgment when it's uh, explained, when the decision is explained. Okay. The judge also decides on matters of something which may arise during a hearing. Matters of proceedings, matters of procedure, matters of process, or matters of course. So it's the matters of procedure. When we are dealing with procedure, Issues, it's the matters of procedure, is the term that is used in, in EU instruments. So the questions that we have now are a bit more difficult, as you could see, a bit more uh, precise. Let's see, scoreboard still has the same five people. A court may, under exceptional circumstances, something the enforcement proceedings, state enforcement proceedings, stop the enforcement proceedings, block the enforcement proceedings, or disrupt the enforcement proceedings. Stay the enforcement proceedings is the correct term. So stop the enforcement proceedings. Of course, this uh, this this makes sense um, in the in in terms of the content, uh, in in terms of the concept, in terms of its meaning. But stay in proceedings is the official term that is being used for this. Okay, congratulations still for the same five people. The something party should bear the costs of the proceedings, the wealthier party, the winning party, the unrepresented party, or the unsuccessful party should bear the costs of proceedings. Unsuccessful, okay, yeah, this one was easy. And the last one, let's see if someone can still change the order.
A court may hold an oral hearing through video conference or other na -na -na, if the technical means are available. Other computer program, other machinery, other communication technology, or other electronic components, which is the term that is being used. Yes, communication technology is the term used in uh, regulations. So Sarah is Sarah took the third spot. Congratulations. Julio has the second spot. And da -da 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 Spur has the first place. Congratulations to everyone who was participating. Yaka was the fourth and B was the fifth. Congratulations to everyone who participated. You did great, especially the ones who guessed basically every answer correctly. I can see that uh, the, 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 uh, the, the questions could be a bit more difficult than they actually were. Um, so the difficult question seems to be this. So after hearing the case, the court issues what judgment so grounded, ju uh, grounded judgment was, was what most of you said, and it should be a reasoned judgment. The judge also decides on matters of procedure was the right answer, which may arise during a hearing. And a court may, under exceptional circumstances, stay the enforcement proceedings was the correct answer here. Uh, you did very well, though. So congratulations to everyone. I hope you learned something in spite of uh, the questions being ver very easy, apparently. Um, so because we, we still have some time, we will just go and do some, um, some more exercises that I have, that me and Christian actually have prepared. So uh, those uh, terms that we were using cover cross-border enforcement in general, not, not, not all of them are focusing on the regulations that we are doing here. So we will also just check some special terms that are dealing specifically, that are typical specifically for the European order for payment regulation. So I would like to ask you now to maybe take some piece of paper and a pen. Uh, this is not, not the competition anymore. Uh, so you can take your time and maybe just write down the answers and we will check them if you have them correctly. Um, so you have the text here, you have missing words. Um, there is a verb in the bracket. You have to do the word formation, change it to the noun, basically. So a European order for payment is served on a defend. You have to change it to a noun. Um, there, are, um, there are two um, screens. There are two slides for this one. So I will give you a, two minutes to finish this one first, and then we will, we will go to the second one, and then we will see the answers. So yes. You can choose the correct words. Okay, I hope you managed to finish those. You have the second one now.
Okay, I, because there were not that many, I'm sure that most of you managed already. So let's check the answers. Uh, a European order for payment is served on a defendant is the correct answer, of course, in accordance with the national law of the state in which service is to be effective. So those were quite easy. The regulation sets out minimum procedural standards re regarding service either with, with or without proof of receipt by the defendant. So maybe this last one, if you didn't guess, but the rest should be very easy. Uh, service with proof of receipt. In the case of personal service, the defendant signs an acknowledgement of receipt, including the day of receipt. Personal service, again, the, com the competent person who effected the service signs a duly dated document stating that the defendant has received the document or refused to receive, to receive it without any legal justification. And the last one, the defendant signs and returns a duly dated, duly dated acknowledgement of receipt when the European order for payment is received by post or by electronic means such as fax or email. So those are the correct answers. I hope you guessed all of them. And now the last exercise that we have in this workshop, and then I'm letting you to deal with more contents again uh, in terms of legal documents. Um, so in this one, it has, uh, there will be three slides uh, and there are again missing words, but in this case, you have to choose the synonyms. So the word that has the same meaning, like in the first case, if interest is asked for, you should find the word that also means asked for from the words that are listed here. So on every slide, you will have the same words listed, so you don't have to write all of them down. So just um, if you have a piece of paper, just write one and what is the correct word. And then on the next one, you will have the same words again here. So, okay, so try to do this one first. For each one, there will be a synonym among the words that are listed here. So the word that means the same thing. Okay, let's go to the next one. Oh, and be careful, you have, you have the words that are listed, so you have them in, in infin, infinitive form. Uh, maybe you have to change the tense or the form. Like if you have a word laid down, maybe you have to change it so it fits the sentence. Okay, and the last one.
Okay, let's check the answers now. If if we would if we were live, I would ask you what question what answers you provided. But um, well, we can still do the same thing. So maybe let's check. Um, does anyone want to let me know what you wrote under the first option? So if interest is asked for, what would be the synonym? If anyone wants to try, if you don't, I will give the, the answers. I know it's easier if we are live. Yeah, okay. No one is really enthusiastic, right? So let's check it like that. So uh, if interest is asked for, the synonym, the synonym is sought. So you had to put it in the past tense. So seek sought. If interest is sought, this should be specified for each claim in accordance with the codes indicated on the form. The code must contain both the relevant number, first row of the codes, and the letter, second row of the codes. For instance, if the interest rate has been agreed by contract and covers yearly or annual periods. So this is the synonym. The code is O2A. The next one. If it is for the court to decide the amount of interest, the last box should be left empty. The other word is blank. And the code 06E should be used. Code 01 refers to an interest rate established. Alisopominka laid down. Uh, you, again, you had to change the form by statute. Please bear in mind, mind or the synonym note, please note that in commercial transactions, as referred to in the directive, on, fight, on fighting or combating. So fighting on, or combating are the synonyms, late payments. The statutory interest rate is the sum of the interest rate applied by the European Central, Central Bank to its most recent uh, main refinancing transaction or operation. So transaction or operation carried out before the first calendar day of the half year in question, plus a minimum of or at least seven percentage points. So minimum of is the same as at least. And the last one for a member state which is not participating in the third phase or stage. So stage is the synonym of economic and monetary union. The reference rate referred to above is the equivalent rate set at the domestic or national level. So domestic national, uh, in both cases, the reference rate applicable or the reference rate in force on the first calendar day of the half year in question will apply. Um, so if you had all the answers correct, then you have a very good command of uh, legal English that is being used in this EU uh, instruments. Otherwise, I hope you learned something. So I didn't want to uh, only have a lecture because you're listening to a lot of lectures in the seminar anyway. I wanted to have this a bit more interactive, more of a workshop. And I hope you found it interesting. So this would be it from me. I really hope that I provided some new information, even if the questions were a bit easy in the Kahoot. So thank you for your attention, everyone.